Tonight, I want to just uh, introduce to you Dr. Hopkins and give him his maximum amount of time. Jamal Dominique Hopkins was named Dean of Dickerson Green Theological Seminary in 2019. He serves as seminary's inaugural dean and is fast working toward the development of the school as a new theological institute for the 21st century. Dean Hopkins joins a world-class uh, and highly trained theological faculty who is passionately committed to theological education and service in the Christian church. Since the time, since his time at Dickerson Green, he has worked with the faculty to convene the seminary's annual spring institutes and develop a chaplaincy track for the Master of Divinity program. Dean Hopkins has also developed the Graduate Seminary Ambassadors, a graduate seminary student group that serve as peer mentors for incoming students and ambassadors for theological education. He has also established the Dickerson Green Theological a Seminary Fellows Program, which invites uh, theological and religious scholars in both the church and the academy to engage in the work of Christian scholarship and practice. Since, he, since his uh, tenure as Dean, uh, Dickerson Green has rolled out its Master of Arts and Religious Studies and implemented numerous online and hybrid format courses. Dean Hopkins is excited about the work of theological education and establishing Dickerson Green Theological Seminary as a training institution of choice for the larger body of Christian churches. Uh, Dean Hopkins is also the first, and I think even now the only uh, Dead Sea Scrolls scholar who is African American. Uh, he is a scholar of the Old Testament and the New Testament, but I know Dr. Hopkins as Jamal Dominique a good friend and brother in Christ, and it's a privilege to have him join us tonight. Uh, Jamal, it is in your hands. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate you, uh, Dr. Harris, um, Joel. Um, good to be here with you and this community. I'm happy to share. Uh, Dr. Harris uh, gave me a call and asked me would I be interested in sharing with this community, and so I I'm delighted to, and it's a privilege. Um, I have a few slides for you as I get started on uh, in my presentation. I, I kind of want to leave some room and some time for us to have for uh, conversation. Um, but um, uh, my slides, uh, the, uh, the, the Lead Like King project, I, I kind of want to focus on um, King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, what we call the beloved community. And so if we go to the uh, second slide, uh, there's a quote here from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, April 3rd, 1957, um, just about a decade before his last, his very last speech that he would give in Memphis, Tennessee at Mason Temple uh, Church of God in Christ, the headquarters, uh, which would be the day before, or the day, yeah, the day before his assassination, 1968, April 4th. Uh, and this quote reads, there are certain things we can say about this method that seeks justice without violence or justice with violence. It does not seek to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win his friendship and understanding. I think that this is one of the points, uh, one of the basic points, one of the basic distinguishing points between violence and nonviolence. The ultimate end of violence is to defeat the opponent. The ultimate end of nonviolence is to win friendship of the opponent. It is necessary to boycott sometimes, but the nonviolent resistor realized that boycott is never an end within itself, but merely a means to awaken a sense of shame with, within the oppressor. That the end of reconciliation, the end is redemption. And so the aftermath of violence is bitterness. The aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The aftermath of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. This is a method that seeks to transform and to redeem and win the friendship of the opponent and to make it possible for men to live together as brothers in a community and not continually live with bitterness and friction. And this is taken from Martin Luther King Jr.'s Justice Without Violence, April 3rd, 1957. And so the next slide just kind of sums this all up. What is the beloved community? Quote, 
Our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. So think about that. As we go to the next slide, think about that. And so what I wanna talk about is I wanna talk about evangelical responses to racial justice, building this beloved community, evangelical responses to racial justice. And I have, there are four responses and I, was working on a project, I've been working on this for several years, um, looking at the response to racial justice, racial equality, um, which is part of a, a subgroup of, of social justice or social, social righteousness, if you will. But this idea of racial justice. And so what we have is we have four responses. There's the silent response, and you can imagine what that is. There's the reductionist response, there's conscious acknowledgement, and finally there's solidarity. And so I just wanna share just, uh, for, uh, just for, for some moments before we open this up for conversation, uh, you take that slide away. Uh, and I'll just, I wanna share a little bit from my, my, my research. 10 years after Martin Luther King Jr.'s initial visit to my hometown, my hometown is uh, Southern California, Pasadena, California. Um, Martin Luther King Jr visited there, but 10 years uh, after King's initial visit, which was in 1958, Paul King Jewett, who was an evangelical professor at the city's only theological seminary, addressed a letter to King's wife, Coretta Scott King. Jewett reached out to her in the aftermath of her husband's assassination and funeral. The letter dated April 9th, 1968, was written only five days after an assassin's bullet ripped through King's body taking his life while he stood on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. King and his colleagues came to Memphis in support of sanitation workers protesting the strike. And so King actually um, was, 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 he stood shoulder to shoulders with those who were um, op oppressed and um, those who were working under unfair working conditions and the untimely death of a Memphis sanitation worker while on the job. And so in 1968, Paul King Jewett was one of the only a handful of white evangelicals at that particular time that heeded the call, the Christian call of racial brotherhood. Being my, my brother's keeper also conveyed in Matthew 7 and 12 and Luke 6, 31, where the injunction to do unto others as you would have them do unto you is given. Jewett's racial or response to racial injustice led him to carry out his Christian walk by aligning in solidarity with African Americans from the time he began working at Fuller Theological Seminary in 1955. At the time Jewett penned his letter to Coretta Scott King, he was returning from Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral. The letter dated the same day of that service was written at the Atlanta airport and Jewett's impulse was unique for a white evangelical male of his time, very unique. Jewett's letter to Coretta uh, implicitly reveals the humanitarian and moral social challenge that King posited to Christian evangelicals at that particular time, and I feel even today. A challenge that even Carl F.H. Henry, who was at the time um, that Jewett uh, came to Fuller, he was there by one year, and he, of course, went on to be one of the founders, the key founders of Christianity today. But this was a challenge that Carl F.H. Henry wrote about 20 years earlier in his 1947 work, The Uneasy Consciousness of Modern Fundamentalism. And in some respects, King's consternation with his own fundamentalist upbringing, and King referred to his own upbringing as a fundamentalist upbringing, um, was that King felt that even that fundamentalism, that Christian fundamentalism lacked a social moral imperative and intellectual critical engagement. So Jewett's letter and Christian walk appeared to have been a response in heed to King's indictment. In his condolences to Coretta Scott King, Jewett notes his appreciation for her husband's Christian ethic via his orthopraxis, giving his life for the least of these. As a result of this, Jewett mentions the efforts made by his students to bring King actually to Fuller Seminary. Jewett's letter to Coretta indeed revealed 
his Christian conviction and appears to be a direct response to Martin Luther King Jr.'s social ethical challenge and Fuller Theological Seminary and by extension, larger white evangelicalism's neglect towards racial and social justice. As Jewett's letter revealed, which is akin to what Carl F.H. Henry asserted, uh, King's civil rights work was particularly challenging to white evangelicalism in that the said group minimalized the responsibility that the Christian moral imperative to reflect social justice, racial equality, and integration chiefly in the face of white privilege and supremacy. So Jewett's letter came on the heels of his own president and colleague, Edward J. Carnell. He was a president at Fuller at that particular time. Um, Edward Carnell's publicly diminishing the race problem in contemporary society. And so Carnell's impulse, uh, which reflected a dominant view at the seminary at the time, it came with a twist. While asserting that personal salvation largely resolved social concerns, ironically, this same view served as his own indictment, especially in the face of his self-confessed inability of allowing the gospel of salvation to convert and govern his own attitudes and behavior regarding race. In an address to Reinhold Niebuhr, who challenged Billy Graham to come to terms with the race issue, Carnell confessed and excuses his failure to recognize racial justice in light of his own racial pride and privileged status. Carnell writes, quote, I find it easy to be patient with Billy Graham. Though I have been preaching for many years, I have never devoted an entire sermon to the sins of the white man. And the chief reason for this is my failure to find a way to measure and defeat racial pride in my own life. It is not easy to preach against oneself. Ministers expose the sins of laity with great passion and eloquence, but they seldom expose the sins of ministers. It is not that we are unwilling to do the Christian thing by a brother. The problem is that being sinners, we are powerless to approach racial injustice from the perspective, from a perspective higher than a prudential balance of personal interest. Deep down in his heart, Billy Graham is just as anxious about racial pride as Reinhold Niebuhr. But myself, my, but my suspicion is that like he, like myself, is not quite sure how to go about that matter, close quote. A beneficiary under this kind of double-minded, uh, hazy leadership would hardly find comfort in or trust in this ability to socially thrive. And so Jewett's letter reflected his impulse to racial injustice. It was one of four evangelical responses um, that, uh, he was, you know, at, at Fuller Theological Seminary, and by extension, larger white evangelicalism, which also reflected the attitudes of the white citizens of the city. So Jewett's culturally racial response was marginal and extraordinarily unique to the ethos, ethos of Fuller and larger evangelicalism and the city at that time. He uh, carried out his convictions of solidarity both in theory and in practice. So a second response, uh, which um, came out, um, reflected the impulse of two founding members of Fuller Seminary at that particular time. Harold Ockengay, who served as the first president of the seminary, and Carl F.H. Henry, um, of, at that time, Fuller's noted uh, Fuller Seminary and larger evangelicalism's foremost theolog theologian of the time. So this response is essentially, of the second response, uh, especially was reflected from Henry's, uh, his 1947 work, The Uneasy Consciousness of Modern Fundamentalism, where he confessed that despite championing sound biblical ex exegesis regarding personal righteousness, responses to world crisis, however, served to embarrass fundamentalism. Both Akande and Henry recognized the need for Christian fundamentalism to have a social agenda in line with Jesus and the gospel. Without this was to operate in fundamentalist isolation. Quote, if Bible-believing Christian is on the wrong side of the social problem, such as war, race, class, labor, liquor, imperialism, et cetera, it is time to get over the fence to the right side. The church needs a progressive fundamentalism with a social message, close quote. Such a message seemed to fall on deaf 
evangelical ears, though. In less than 10 years after Fuller's, uh, Fuller was established, the seminary's leadership took a different turn in a different direction, a step backwards concerning racial justice issues. This divergence away from especially Henry's articulated justice convictions indeed shaped the direction of the institution for decades to come, and, and evangelicalism essentially for decades to come. Akinge uh, later regressed from his seemingly early racial justice progressiveness, perhaps early only gesturing for evangelicalism to be more uh, racial justice consciousness. He responded to an indictment of evangelicals racial economic exploitation, vociferously denying that exploitation exists against African Americans. And he wrote, quote, not all national evangelical leaders shared Chuck Colson and uh, Hatfield's enthusiasm. Of course, he was a congressman at that particular time in the early 70s. Hill Akinge, president of an influential evangelical seminary in Massachusetts, was furious when John Perkins criticized free market capitalism in a lecture. He responded in a public statement to the disgruntled board members who had heard about Perkins remark, I don't think there's any exploitation of the black race in America today, close quote. Reflecting yet another evangelical response um, was Edward J. Carnell, uh, Akinge's successor at Fuller Theological Seminary. Carnell bluntly presented a reductionist view of racism in America, advancing the notion that salvation convicts and converts moral attitudes and self-governed behavior. This new leadership at Fuller Seminary advanced a theology of personal salvation that at the same time oversimplified the deeply embedded severity of systemic racial privilege and class. Further. Further curious was that while softly gesturing that racism in America was a problem, a utopian theological impetus which created cultural isolationism, ethnocentrism, and a disconnection concerning social justice was put forth. Overall, this particular response, uh, this reductionist response, characterized Christian fundamentalism uh, so as to, uh, quote, theologically cognitively minded that they were no earthly good. This is what uh, Ronald Potter writes in one of his works. Um, he rightly noted that white evangelicals are doctrinally, uh, uh, that even though they were doctrinally correct, though they were ethically bankrupt, close quote. The fourth and, and final uh, response that we see among evangelicals with regard to uh, racial justice is silence. This response essentially stood um, in direct uh, contrast, of course, to the solidarity response, but also this response was almost the uh, a kind of uh, an impulse, uh, a kind of a silent impulse um, that was one of reductionism, if you will. So the first, this fourth response, uh, chiefly was the non-expressed felt impulse of the of, of a third evangelical response, was was which upheld a utopian theological construct that understood personal salvation as that which convicts and converts self-governed moral attitudes and behavior. This silent response was the predominant attitude at this particular time, particularly among the administration at Fuller Theological Seminary, its faculty, its students, and uh, particularly the school's founding up until the appointment of its first black board member of 1972, and his hiring of his first black faculty member in 1974. So we have from 1947 to 1974, when actually this institution, which is perhaps maybe one of the most uh, noted uh, progressive evangelical institutions of the country. Um, so this institution um, was established by, we know, noted radio evangelist Charles Fuller in 1947. By the time Jewett joined the faculty eight years later, the seminary had not enrolled a single black student, but only during Jewett's tenure did the school begin to admit black students and its first full-time black member um, who came nearly around 20 years uh, later or after Jewett's tenure with Fuller. Uh, so by the time Jewett moved to Pasadena and came uh, on the faculty in 1955, the dominant response to social and racial justice was either silence or a reductionist one. Jewett began uh, his tenure at the school 
a year after Carnell assumed the presidency. And that, the, and that was the same year that King engaged in the Montgomery bus boycott. King's early civil rights effort enabled him to travel across the country, uh, raising support for his work and speaking about the significance of integration and racial equality for all African-Americans. National visibility in Montgomery resulted in his 1958 appearance uh, in Pasadena at Caltech, about a half a mile east of the seminary. King made two subsequent appearances in the city around 60 and 65, and it was around one of these visits that uh, it's likely that Jewett wa invited King to come to address the seminary community. Um, and so the founding of the seminary was roughly 11 years before King's visit to the city. Carnell, who had assumed uh, the presidency for uh, four years before King's visit, came to the, to the seminary a year after its development. And for five years, he served alongside Carl F.H. Henry as the school's second most noted theological professor. Carnell's rise to the rank of presidency was quick and unsettling to many of his, his faculty colleagues. Um, this was due in part to his lack of administrative experience, uh, according to their records, uh, and his junior professorial rank, and what they would call his aloofness and elite scholarly approach towards his colleagues and students. Such characteristics were more exacerbated by his dogged yet oversimplified position surrounding racial concerns. A, a year after Carnell's presidential promotion, Jewett joined the faculty, uh, but this was also Carl F.H. Henry's final year as a faculty member at the institution, um, which was a year prior to the school enrolling its first black student. Carnell's response to social and racial justice was symptomatic, symptomatic of the Christian fundamentalism of, of the time in general, and the ethnocentric discriminatory impulse of larger white uh, American citizens of the time. With, while this impulse was not brazenly strident, such an attitude nonetheless was complicit towards the systemic practice of racial hostility and discrimination. So again, Ronald Potter notes, uh, notably indicts Carnell where he, we're here, um, Carnell socially problematizes African-Americans, particularly with regard to um, living in white neighborhoods. So Carnell uh, says that African-Americans at a particular time, he says Negroes inherently spoil certain white social comforts. For Carnell, that was a justice issue. Quote, to much stress on Racial, too much stress on racial injustice will divert the center's attention from the need to repent from his total, from his totality self-centered life. If we let uh, black folks buy a house in a fashionable suburb, we do an injustice to vested property interests, close quote. Residents confirm that uh, blacks were confined to certain living quarters throughout uh, the Northwest section of Pasadena at this particular time. Many of these homes along with black churches were later relocated due to redevelopment plans and the additional uh, or the addition of uh, the interstate freeway going through their communities. Up until the time of Martin Luther King Jr's uh, uh, visit to Pasadena, ra the racial climate at Fuller Seminary uh, was less than equitable. Now with the presence of the school's first black students, perhaps additional efforts were made to connect with King. It's clear from Jewett's letter that his interest in social or civil rights and social justice for African-Americans was not merely passe. And so Jewett's time um, at Fuller mentoring students, as well as he was actually one of the early inspirators for um, prompting those uh, first founders of the National Black Evangelical Association um, to really uh, support them. He actually became one of the first bo white board members of the National Negro Evangelical Association, which later would be called the National Black Evangelical Association. Um, Jewett also would, uh, he would attend the March on Washington in 1963. Uh, Jewett also would, would pastor a predominantly African-American Methodist church in the city uh, in Pasadena while he was a professor at Fuller Seminary. Um, he befriended one of the particular, one of the students who actually was one of the leaders of the National Black Evangelical Association, William Hiram Bentley. Bentley credits Paul Jewett with, with actually, with, with essentially uh, 
um, um, keeping him connected and remaining um, what he would call evangelical at that particular time. Uh, he mentored him, he supported his efforts, and uh, his widow, Bentley's widow, even uh, in a discussion I had with her some years back, she mentions that Paul Jewett actually came to their home uh, in the west side of Chicago. He stayed with them for about a week, um, and he was just, you know, he had a sense of solidarity. Uh, and so if, if we go back to the slides and we look at these responses again, so the silent response, the silent response, you go to the next slide. The silent response is chiefly a non-expressed felt impulse of a reductionist view. This view upholds a utopian theological construct that construes personal salvation as that which convicts and converts self-governed social moral attitudes and behavior. This silent response is predominantly cultural, is a predominantly cultural attitude and is demonstrated by virtually no representational leadership in institutional positions of authority. Uh, we see this in predominantly white uh, faith uh, or, or white uh, even uh, or educational institutions. There's also the view that discussions about race are more divisive and more harmful than helpful. And perhaps the fear here is that uh, racial equality is, is feared or believing that whiteness is superior is actually a felt impulse. Finally, this evangelical uh, silent response, we would see um, those who espouse a utopian colorblind society. So the next slide, the second response, uh, an evangelical reductionist response. And so this response softly gestures that racism in America is problematic while promoting a utopian theological construct. Such a construct creates cultural isolationism, ethnocentrism, and disconnecting uh, concerning social justice, or disconnection concerning social justice. So overall, this response characterizes um, uh, Christian evangelicalism as what Ronald Potter calls doctrinally correct, though ethically bankrupt. And that's taken from his uh, 1979 work, uh, The New Black Evangelical. And so reductionism is the act of oversimplifying an issue. And responses can include um, people saying, my forefathers or foreparents were European immigrants and they weren't involved in slavery. Uh, or I have many black friends, almost as if measuring progress and equality uh, is based on privilege and assumption reducing personal experiences as non-measurable data, or you know, token representation, even suggesting that qualified, diverse individuals cannot be found. And so the next slide. This response is evangelicals' conscious acknowledgement. And this response was reflected from the work of Carl F.H. Henry's uh, in his work, The Uneasy Consciousness of Modern Fundamentalism where he confesses that despite championing sound biblical exegesis in regard to personal righteousness, responses to world crisis, however, serves to embarrass fundamentalism. And so Henry writes, uh, if the Bible believing Christian is on the wrong side of the social problems, such as race, war, class, liquor, labor, imperialism, etc., it's time to get over the fence to the right side. The church needs a progressive fundamentalism with a social message. And so the last slide, solidarity is, is not only one of the most active, it's, it's not only active social engagement, but it's active personal involvement. And such a response is culturally and politically provocative, especially in the time of de facto and de, de jure racism and privilege. And of course, we saw the example of Christian, evangelical Christian in solidarity with Robert Jewett, uh, a noted evangelical who taught at Fuller Seminary from 55 to 93. And so I really wanted to show a model and Jewett really served as a, as a great model for this uh, response. And so Jewett's response to social and racial justice was extraordinarily unique during his time and went against the ethos of the seminary that he taught and larger white evangelicalism, stuck his neck out on the line in a sense. He carried out his convictions of solidarity, both in theory and in practice. And so his response, uh, and believe even I believe his letter was in response to Martin Luther King Jr.'s call to the beloved community. Uh, and so with that, I just you know like to engage in conversation, like to engage in discussion, um, you know, if we have some conversation.
Well, Dr. Dr. Hopkins, thank you. Um, this has been this has been great, and uh, thank you for the the historical um, perspective and and the uh, the information that you shared. Um, I have a few questions and and some things that kind of lead us off here in discussion. Um, but before we do that, though, um, I want to encourage everybody. If you've got questions, if you've got comments, um, things you'd like uh, Dr. Hopkins maybe to go deeper on or clarifications, um, please by all means share those in the in the chat. Um, and I will, um, I'll make sure that we get to those as we continue um, into this uh, time of discussion. Um, and so with that, um, Dr. Hopkins, I'd like to, to kick it off. Um, just a thought, uh, if you could, um, and I can put this slide up, but uh, I love how you shared the, the four responses um, of, of evangelicals. And um, could you talk about maybe, um, I'm just curious, is that historically seen as, is that sort of a continuum or are there responses where um, people have just kind of come down as automatically like Jew, it seems to be uh, solidly in the solidarity response. Um, but is there a historical example of, or even a modern example of people um, kind of walking through where they go from silence uh, and then sort of adopt a reductionist and then a conscious acknowledgement. And if that is so, if it is a, a continuum, um, how, what are the practical ways that, that people move through that, um, that process? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Joel. Um, I, I do think there is a continuum. I think there's a possible continuum. You know, what we see with Harold Ockengay, we see the kind of continuum in reverse. We see that he is expressing kind of a conscious acknowledgement alongside Carl F.H. Henry. But when pressed, um, he seems to backtrack. And that was his response to uh, John Perkins. Uh, I think it was during a 1978 conference uh, John Perkins gave. But so to it, that may be uh, kind of a trajectory uh, or backtracking. I think there also can be a trajectory towards moving more towards solidarity. And I think that comes with education. I think that comes with opening oneself up, uh, having conversations and being open um, having having conversations, learning educationally, um, and like Paul Jewett, Paul Jewett probably didn't start there, but as he saw and maybe learned and heard from the words of King, I mean, in that letter that Paul Jewett writes to Coretta Scott King, he talks about his impressions of how um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s work made such an impact on the least of these. Uh, he talked about going to um, the funeral site, going to the wake, uh, and seeing poor people taking off, poor people that were working in the fields, poor people that were living in these shotgun houses and homes and in the South. And, you know, Atlanta in 1950s, Atlanta in the 1960s was, was very racially polarized. And so he talked about how that impacted him. And he talked about and compared how that compares to the grand cathedrals that he had seen throughout Europe uh, during his travels and during his time. And I think that had an impact on him. And I think that it, it, it um, you know, he had to reconcile that, you know, the same Jesus, the same Christ that we preach, the same Christ that, uh, you know, that we talk about and we engage with in our congregations, these poor people, these people that don't have anything, paying homage to a man who gave his life for the work of poor people. If that's not the Christian gospel and an orthopraxis, I don't know what is. And I think that really got to him. And I think that helped him to develop the sense of solidarity. Yeah, I wanna jump in there a little bit. Um, this is really exciting. I think that what you've exposed is there's a fundamental problem with a faith tradition that privileges privatized spirituality. Me and Jesus, I love my Jesus. I'm going to heaven, I love everybody. This sort of spirituality is so heavenly minded to no earthly good. And part of the challenge is that we try to hold on to something that doesn't work because it undermines the fundamental humanity that we all have. Yeah. So you, you said that education is what we need, but you just critiqued an educational institution <laughs> that, 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 that claims to be providing education, but it's a type of education that is detrimental and destructive. It's destructive. And I think we have to really think deeply about our own faith traditions and our own commitments to theology and church and spirituality and, and ask ourselves, at, in what place in my life have I allowed 
my claims on faith to undermine my affirmation of another person's humanity. There, it should not be where there's a Christian, a, a person who believes that Jesus Christ is their savior, where they have to be taught to love somebody who's different than them. You know, you raise the you raise the notion that education can't only be found within these educational institutions, these ivory, right. to, ivory towers. Right. Uh, it, the, the, the greatest education you can get is actually, you know, we talk about mission, going in the mission field. Well, there's a mission field right here in your backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's that's the greatest education. You go across town, you spend time with that person that doesn't have the kind of social privilege or accoutrements that you may have, that's an education. And it's, it's in theory with practice. How does your theory that you've learned, how does it actually work when you put your boots on the ground? Um, and I, 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 I love Jewett as this model because of what he did. I mean, he passed, Jewett was a Presbyterian but he was in so, so such solidarity with the black community in, in the city that he pastored uh, as an interim pastor, a predominantly black Methodist church. So it wasn't a, really about the denomination as much as it was about the people. It is about exposure, right? Cause you have people who, I mean, you mentioned that there was a guy who says, this is a detriment to the people in the community is because people are unexposed. I think when we're exposed to people and that humanity and we learn we get out of our silos and the other becomes a dehumanized reality but when we uh allow ourselves to feel i'm thinking bob right here who, who's joined us bob bob got so you don't mind me telling it mark bob got so emotional talking about a young man who he's who he tutors it's because he had a connection with the humanity of that little boy that, that his humanity connected with the humanity of the little boy. And this is the great privilege we have here at the Presbyterian, at um, First Presbyterian Church working with the homeless. They're not the other somewhere out of sight, out of mind who you make judgments about, but there are people who you're seeing come into the church. That's the great benefit of service um, if we understand it the right way, right? It could be um, a sort of a white guilt or you know a way of trying to give back to the community or it can be connecting with the humanity of a person who you've never had the opportunity to get to know. Yeah. And so Bob is a surgeon, a, a retired surgeon, but to be able to work with the, with the kids over at Jay Cox Elementary School, there was a connection based on human connectedness. And to me, when we stop meeting people by being black or being, so far as I'm concerned, meet somebody who is a heterosexual or gay or or um, if a, meet a person who's Muslim. Or, or, once we as Christians learn to connect with another humanity, another's humanity, then we don't have to be taught to love somebody who has a skin color that's different than us. To me, that's the just most absurd thing. You, you know, uh, it, it, it Recently, I've been watching and looking and having conversations, just few conversations with, with you know, certain groups of evangelicals, uh, white evangelicals, where, especially on certain issues, political issues, and especially the political rift between, you know, where do where do you vote and why do you vote, and there tends to be, I think, among uh, um, some, to look at to diminish experience, to minute to minute. So, so I can't, I may not. I, I may not be able to gather data, gather statistics on um, you know, the racial profiling of African-Americans in you know, certain cities, but, but those experiences are no less reality because when you have an experience of walking into a store and being followed and being looked at and being you know, treated in a certain way, you, you kind of know that, hey, you know, I, I remember being, even being in Italy and I was standing in line uh, waiting to get my gelato and I was the next one in line and I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and I'm like what's, what's going on and so after so many minutes I got frustrated there was a line behind me and as soon as I got out of the line you know the next people were white they helped him and I, I stood there for a little while and said are they going to continue to help people and so it it it, it it's it's yeah I, I don't know what to say about that experience, but yeah, I mean, when we 
you know, experiences can't always be measured by data or statistics. And so I think what you're saying, getting to know people, uh, understanding the humanity is vitally important. God calls us, Christ calls us, the gospel calls us to be a brother's keeper. But in order to be your brother, your sister's keeper, you got to get to know one another. You got to you know, walk side by side. And, you know, we are all neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. We're part of a global community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it strikes me that because you talk about the beloved community, because that's the goal, right? It's how yeah. do we get to a place where a person is a part of a of life together, a community, right? Rather than an object that I got to be taught to appreciate. <laughs> you know, when I go to the go to the uh, art gallery, you have to tell me about the piece of art so that I can. Oh, okay, I see now. I understand. But human experience should not be objectified in that way. And I think that I was I was on a panel not too long ago where I was trying to tell a group of people who value spirituality, the, 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 the uh, baptism of the spirit. I said, listen, we are not called to be spirit beings. So why do we focus so much energy on a spiritual so a, 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 a worship experience? That is the worship experience actually should fuel our ability to be fully human. God doesn't call us to be angels as in the angels flying around in the sky somewhere, but he calls us to be human. And the whole point of God coming to earth in Christ was to provide an opportunity for us, one, to affirm our humanity, but also to provide an opportunity for us to live into the fullness of what it means to be a human being. And until we understand what another another person's humanity, we can never really live out our own humanity. That's true. And, and I don't and I question whether or not how close we might be able to get even close to the Holy Spirit. You know, when I think of the Zusa Street revival, that revival at such a time where it was not lawful for black people, white people, white male, black males worshiping with white females. I mean, it was a global a reality and experience, but it was the Holy Spirit's prompting. And so the Holy Spirit in worship, <laughs> the unadulterated worship, and the Holy Spirit shows up. Holy Spirit has the ability to gather all people, all races, all creeds, gender, color. Um, and and I, so that kind of makes me question sometimes whether or not when we worship so segregatedly, where's the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all. And sometimes I, I kind of question that. Um, yeah, yeah. So looking at the Zusa Street Revival model. Mm -hmm. Well, see, I think deeper than all than than the discussion about um, the humanity piece is the sin of pride, right? And it's enshrined in systems and structures. Would you agree with that? In the sense that if you look at the economic structure of, of American society, for example, if we talk about we want equality, we're really asking for something that the systems can't produce or can't support. Because the systems are built that you got to have some people on the bottom in order for the system to work. Now, historically, they were Black people at the bottom. Now we're making a case that Black and white should actually be equal. Well, if you make a case of black and white should be equal, but you're trying to make the case within the current system, you're suggesting that somebody else got to be on the bottom. So the question is, do, do black people want white people on the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Or do black and whites want to work together and have people with disability on the bottom? Because the systems and structures as they are only exist and work insofar that you have some on the top and some on the bottom. This is the same thing it is when it comes to theology. When you talk about these fundamentalist evangelicals, somebody has got to be the devil in order for me to feel like I'm a Christian. Yeah, yeah. So then you always got to have this binary piece going on, right? I got to be on my way to heaven and enjoying the trip. And it's only as powerful as it is that I'm telling you, you're going to hell. Well, so yeah, somebody's got to, now if you're Pentecostals, now I mean classical back in the day, if you're Presbyterian, you're going to hell. So we save and they're not. <laughs> yeah, you got you got Somebody's got to be going to hell. 
in order for what I got to work because you have this binary spirituality where, you, you know, so then there's something fundamentally wrong with a theological framework that, that demeans a group of people based on systems like that. And what happens, I think, you tell me if you're wrong, because this is all speculation, that when it came down to this notion of this racial issue, the reason you gave a narrative there that at a seminary that existed for so long in Southern California, after Azusa Street has already taken the world by storm in early 1900s, when they were, when um, Frank Broderman says that the, the color line was washed away in the blood. You had all that going on in the early 1900s. Now you're 1947, you got an evangelical church that starts. Never takes a cue on what the spirit has done in Azusa Street or anywhere, but builds this evangelical paradigm where for several years they're white only, and you're still talking about after that experience in California. Now we still, now we're talking California, right? This is not Georgia, this is California. Mm -hmm. so, so you still have this stronghold of a racial tension because I think at the time, part of the whole um, whiteness was upheld by theological, ideological, theological frameworks that upheld it. Yeah. And I think we cannot ignore that because when you look at civil, the Civil War, there were, there's a book called Civil War and Theology uh, that I was reading that talks about how um, the, the Confederates in the South, they were not just people that are just bad people out there. These people went to church every week. And that theological framework upheld their willingness to fight for slavery. Yeah. So I think we can't get the church off the hook that theological paradigms and religious structures have upheld and in some case created racism, not only racism, but also sexism and the oppression of women. So we gotta, we gotta really rethink how we think, not just politically, but how we think theologically. And I mean this in the pews of the church. How do I think about God in the world? I mean, it's in the Bible. I mean, look at Jesus when he gives the parable of the guy who is, um, you know, he's been smitten, um, beaten and left half dead on the road to Jericho. And there's a Levite that see him pass by on the other side. So he was so church-minded and theologically focused that he missed an opportunity to encounter God in the humanity. That's what I'm saying. He encounter God through a focus on the humanity of a man who is demeaned on the road to Jericho. So how many times do we, um, are we so focused on God that we miss the opportunity to be fully human? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and connect with hurting we people. That we got to get, get out of our own way and... Uh, yeah, the, the Imago Day, you know. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that's what Jewett was all about. It's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think he really was one who took the gospel serious. He read scripture, he took the gospel serious, he did theology, Christian theology, and he had to wrestle with these questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can't ignore this, I think, like you said. These are some real issues, some real problems. His colleague, Carl F.H. Henry, is writing about this. You know something needs to be done and he's responding that beloved community mm -hmm. we can't criticize martin luther king's theology per se it may not have been orthodox but he had a, a tinge of it i mean he was raised and informed by a christian fundamentalism on one side and a christian liberalism education wise but this dilemma that he had he walked among the people he lived among the people. He went to jail with the people. He died for them for what he saw as God sees all of us as human beings worthy of life and worthy of equality. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the beloved community. Hmm. I can go on and on if you want me to continue to talk. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> There, we don't have any uh, we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment. Um, we do have some time though if, if people do want to weigh in and, and um, have some questions or, or uh, some some comments here. Um, yeah, I you know I, I don't have a, a question, um, but as you both were speaking and especially Dr. Hopkins, as you said about um, being able to to provide or to to um, extrapolate statistics about profiling and things like that. Um, but then you talked about the narrative, right? And 
I'm so happy that you started with this quote in your presentation from, from Dr. King, because the phrase that just rings out as you read that is, is about winning friendship. Yeah. Um, and, and statistics, sometimes they, they make changes, sometimes they sway opinions, but if you're in a friendship, um, you hear the narrative and, and that really has an impact. Um, but the fact that he says to win a friendship, um, it's not, it's sometimes a challenge. It's, it's intentional. It's, you have to seek that. And um, so I don't really have a question that, but I was hoping that um, you guys were on a roll. So maybe that will keep well, you, you know, keep you going. <laughs> I think that in, in some sense, the, the healing of those who are oppressed um, will come by those who are oppressors. And, and likewise, those who are ill or those who have some kind of misnotion, misnotion, those who are oppressors, their healing and all their healing can only come through those whom they oppress. And so it's so, we're so intricately connected and so intricately tied. Um, I say this even with, with women, um, women that have been hurt by males their healing comes through men, men males, and, and and likewise, males who've been hurt by you know females, their healing comes through female. And so there's this there's this connectedness, and there we need each other. You know, I I like the song. I think it's uh, Hezekiah Walker. Um, I need you. We need you know. We're all a part of God's family, and so it's it's hard for me and you to live isolated from one another without us affecting one another without us tearing one another down. For me to tear you down means I'm tearing myself down. Um, and so I think once we realize that, and it's going to take getting to know one another, it's going to take seeing one another and seeing each other as human beings uh, in order to, you know, we are all made in God's image and we have to see each other as that, treat each other as we would want to be treated. Um, you don't know, what blessing you might be missing out uh, or what blessing you might be opening up for yourself by befriending that neighbor, that unlikely individual. When I was living in England, um, our closest neighbors, we were living in a, in a building with all Muslims, uh, Shiite Muslims and Sunni, Sunni Muslims who were right across the, uh, the hall from us. <clears throat> and so um, by the time you know, my, my kids were young and I think there was some kind of an incident and I had to rush to take my, uh, one of my children to the hospital and I needed someone to watch my other child, um, this neighbor was such a close neighbor that I trusted him with my, my child to watch my child. Um, he was Muslim, Sunni Muslim from Iran. I mean, we were from worlds apart. We're here in England studying for our degrees in, in Manchester, England. He's from Iran, Sunni Muslim. I'm a Pentecostal from California. And, but it, it was the humanity and the trust and the friendship that we had. Um, and we were able to see past all this other stuff. Um, the stereotypes, where there were no stereotypes. We saw each other as human beings and there was a friendship that was created and a trust. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I think- um, And it uh, seems like the greatest Christian witness is bearing witness to Christ rather than going out and witnessing, right? Yeah. Bearing witness has to do with the embodied witness. Yeah. Right? It's that embodied subversive witness that if we are to win the world for Jesus, as evangelicals often think, we have to win the world by living out the life of Christ yes. uh, in the way that we engage others. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and as you said, that engage that healing process happens um, in a mute in a mutuality. And King talked about that that we're tied together by a mutuality. Yes. And that mutuality has to do with the mutual healing process that happens when two different human beings work together to become something else. It's just like, I mean, two uh, two different human beings work together to create a new narrative. And that's sort of Paul Ricoeur, who is a, a French uh, philosopher who talks about um, the- Chronology, the, right? Understanding yeah. on his own terms. Yeah. Yes, this idea of narrative. You have a story, I have a story. When we come together, we create something new. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of the human experience. And there's a blessing in that. We, we yeah. don't know how, we may be holding a blessing back by not engaging in yeah. 
community and fellowship. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> there's a blessing, you know, I, I like, uh, I think uh, my grandmother used to say, you don't know where your help's coming. You don't know where your blessing's coming. Yeah. If we hold back, we might be holding back a blessing. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm blessed to be here in the community here. You know, getting... Well, I think we're all creating something new together. And the more we work together and we create something new, it's this freshness. I mean, we're, we're, we're making a beeline to Easter right now. Easter is about something new, the birth of something new. Uh, the newness is all around us. And so this, this idea of creating the beloved community comes out of the darkness of the dirt and it, and it, and it, and it, and it merges something new. It's the creation of something new. So that's the excitement that I have about these conversations and about what we're talking about. Because we if we only talk about the problems in the world. We all continue to be sorry about the problems. But the question is, how do I participate in the creation of something new yeah. without losing myself in the process? Is me pouring my whole self, you pouring your whole self into this mutuality that creates something new? Yeah, definitely yeah 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 it's a uh, it's a lot of work out there but i i think if we're willing to willing to roll up our sleeves and um <laughs> work in each other's gardens and uh yeah we can be part of that beloved community mm -hmm. joel excellent well this this was such a um, great discussion and and thank you both um before i close it out though um Dop dr hopkins um, is there a, a final thought, a takeaway, uh, just a closing comment um, you want to leave us with this evening? Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to challenge all of us to uh, look for those individuals like a Paul King Jewett. Um, you know, I, I call it the, the tale of two kings, right? Paul King Jewett and Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and one king was responding to another king. And one king's theology may not have been you know, quite as orthodox or evangelical as the other king's theology, but the other king's orthopraxis very much modeled the kind of orthopraxis that, you know, this evangelical theology was supposed to promote and is supposed to promote. And so in the two and in those relationships, I think one can find oneself because I don't think we realize and we can find even ourselves until we step outside of our own constructs, because maybe our own constructs might be somewhat utopian oriented. Um, and once we're able to step out um, and see and be able to engage, I think that's the beloved community. The beloved community might be invisible because you know, it may not be like a, an institution, but I think the beloved community is all within us if we would just step out and, and begin to um, participate and, and get to know one another. Uh, on a human level. Uh, you never know what your witness might be. I don't know what my Christian witness was to my Sunni Muslim neighbor uh, in England who went back to Iran. Uh, he contacted me some years back, some years later, I still had an impact. And so he can't say you Christians are all like this because he had a friend, uh, at least likely friend uh, that he met in England and we made an impact on one another. That's the beloved community. But I appreciate being here with you guys. And I hope, you know, hope I can join you again some other time in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Hopkins, for your contribution, your blessing to the body of Christ. It's a privilege to have you join us. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll second that. And I'll also extend the invitation anytime you want to want to come back and join us. Um, we would we would love to be uh, in, in further conversation. And, and these discussions are the, the catalyst um, I think that that drives and that grows that beloved community. So thank you, um, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Harris, both um, for, for this this evening. And to everybody that's on this call and to those of you who will watch the recording later, um, thanks for joining and, and being part of this, um, this amazing, amazing discussion. And I am I'm so happy to be able to share the good news that this, con this, this discussion continues uh, next Thursday, um, March the 18th, our beloved community series. Uh, we'll continue as we uh, discuss race, culture, ethnicity, and the New Testament uh, with Dale Coulter at 7 p.m. Uh, you can find the link for the Zoom the same way you found um, this evening's link. And so with that, Dr. Hopkins, Dr. Harris, and all in attendance, um, thank you all for being with us this evening.
we hope that this was a, a blessing for you and a, and a wonderful evening and, and a great discussion. So um, thanks for joining us. And with that, I will say good night.